Hi, my name is David and I'm an alcoholic. Welcome to this virtual open 12-step meeting hosted by Enders Island. This is a one-hour speaker meeting wherein speakers will share their experience, strength, and hope with us. Let us now begin our meeting with a moment of silence as we remember the still sick and suffering both inside and outside the rooms. This is an open 12-step meeting hosted by Enders Island. And while we will reference literature from the 12-step fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, we recognize that other substances and behaviors play a part in both our addiction and recovery. And discussion about such things is welcome here. We will now read the preamble and how it works from the Alcoholics Anonymous literature. The preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. It does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and to help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And from how it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those too who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose, in a general way, what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. If you have decided that you want what we have, and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. At some of these, we balked. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us, but there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the, we stood at the turning point. We asked for his protection and care with complete abandon. Here are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program of recovery. One, we admitted that we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, Made a, fierceless, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, we humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, we made a list of persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. 9. Made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. 10. Continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry it out. 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. 
Many of us exclaim, what an order. I can't go through with it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. The point is that we are willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. One, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. Two, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. And three, that God could and would if he were sought. This is a one hour speaker meeting and our speakers will share from their experience, strength and hope. Our first speaker this evening is Sandra. Welcome, Sandra. Gia Yiv Galer, Sandra is Anam Dum. I'll call her a Tome. Panax the Nefelephoric or of Inu. Hello, my name is Sandra, and I'm an alcoholic, and happy, sober St. Patrick's Day. My last drunk Patrick's Day, St. Patrick's Day, was back in 1995. Thank God, a day at a time. I'm very grateful for this programme. I'm very grateful for my higher power. I'm very grateful for my fellowship. I'm very grateful that anywhere I go in the world, the hand is always there to help one alcoholic to another and help me stay sober. Thank you for helping me stay sober. What it's like, what happened and what it's like now. What it was like, it was dark, it was very dark. There was no joy, there was no hope, there was no happiness. There was nothing to look forward to. My first drink was when I was 12. There was a party in the house, it was a Christmas New Year time. An aunt had come to visit from uh, Australia. And it was about a year or so after my father died. My father died in quite tragic circumstances. And my sister, he uh, was schizophrenic and took his own life. After he took the life of my sister, he had some psychotic episode and uh, this tragedy happened in the family. And I was 10 at that time and uh, there was lots of internalisation, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Lots of, I have no idea what to do with this. And there was very little support back then to deal with that kind of event in a family. So when the opportunity came a couple of years later to pick up a drink, I just jumped at that chance. I don't know where it came from. I had never wanted to drink. I'd never looked at drink. I'd never seen drink in the house. We had the obligatory decanter of brandy or whiskey, whatever, sherry maybe, in the, the glass case. But nobody drank it. Like it was purely for show. My mother liked our ornaments and our and our presses, you know, our show off cabinets, but it was never drank. So I don't know where that came from at that party on that that Christmas time. People were having a lovely time. They were talking. They were laughing. They were just jolly. There was no messing, no chaos. And I seen people putting their drink down to get up and dance or sing a song. And I went around supposedly cleaning up the glasses but pouring what was in those other glasses into a bigger glass and drinking it. Needless to say, I got very, very drunk. I got very, very sick and I had a blackout. And my drinking was to continue in that pattern for the next number of years. I didn't see anything wrong with it. It was just part and parcel of drinking. Bearing in mind that none of my friends did that they may have got sick once or twice so they may have got drunk once or twice but they didn't they didn't do it all the time and they were able to say oh I've enough now I don't, I don't know I'm done and they'd leave drink behind I'd be having palpitations at the idea that a drink could be left behind in a bar so I was the one that was getting drunk and I was the one that was the nuisance and I was the one that people had to tolerate and I was the one that people started to drift away from because I was just too much hassle and I wasn't even 17 at this time. My drinking took me to, from that first drink, 
I came down the next morning and I drank. There was alcohol in the press. It was all tidied up. It was all clean in the press. And I drank. I opened up a can of beer and I drank it. I don't know where that came from. I never seen that. Very shortly after that, I was going into school. I was bringing alcohol into school with me. I was doing jobs, babysitting. All the money was being saved up for drink. I didn't buy makeup. I didn't buy magazines. I didn't buy clothes like my friends were. I was just thinking, okay, that'll get me X amount of, of drink. I was getting served in pubs at 13 and I was going into school with hangovers and with alcohol in the bag. And I imagine a lot of that was masking a lot of the difficulties that happened in the house, uh, you know, as a as a young child. But the fact is, once I started, I couldn't stop. I literally couldn't stop. And no matter what came or went, no matter what row somebody had with me, no matter what relationship broke down, I couldn't stop. I didn't want to stop. I did get into a relationship when I was about 19, 18 or 19 with somebody who was a good number of years older than me. And I drank with him and all his friends who were even older than him again. So I was drinking with, with people who are my age. <laughs> and I was like, oh, these old people, you know, they're not old people today. And, and my life literally centred around the pub and it literally centred around the area I lived in. I didn't go anywhere. The idea of being any further than the area that I was in, that I lived in, filled me full of anxiety. I couldn't, I didn't go to parties. I wasn't invited after a short time anyway, but I didn't go anywhere. I was, I was just too nervous. The anxiety was just too much for me. I needed to be that close to home. And my drinking then was drinking all of the time. Every penny I had went on drink. And I just increased the misery I increased the lack of joy. I increased the lack of happiness. There was no excited expectation. There was nothing to look forward to. There was literally home, pub, home, pub, home, pub. Shortly after that, it was home, pub, maybe have a quick wash out the door. And very quickly that moved into home, pub, home, pub. And no even change of clothes, let alone a shower. It brought me literally to the gutter. Very dark, very lonely place, very isolating place. And no matter who tried to help me, I I couldn't, I couldn't hear it. I thought they were trying to stop me having a good time. There I was, no food, no, no washing, no good hygiene practices, wearing clothes that strung to the high heaven. And I thought they were trying to stop me from having a good time. And that's the nature of this disease. Tells you you haven't got it and it's everybody else. That came to a very abrupt end when I was 28. Thanks be to God a day at a time. I was out all day drinking. I had brought my nephew with me and he was 14 and I sent him home on two buses, which was about 20, 25 miles away from where I was at what I thought was 10 o'clock at night. Lucky for me, it was earlier in the evening. It was March. It was dark. And I was willing to send that child home barely with enough bus fare to get him from where he was to where he needed to be. And I didn't care. I just needed to go. I just needed him to go. And somewhere later on that evening, I had this awakening. And that's all I can call her is an awakening. And I, it's definitely the hand of God was on this. And as I poured the, the, the alcohol from one glass into another, because I might have washed myself. But I was a woman. I was a lady. I wasn't drinking out of a pint glass. I had to drink out of a smaller glass. And as I poured, what became very obvious to me was the empty portion of that glass, the empty part of the glass. And not from a place of, oh, the drink is running out, but from a place of seeing it for what it was, empty. And in that moment, I, I had a moment of clarity like I've never had before or since. This is not working anymore. This is not working. And there was a neighbour of mine at the end of the bar and I, I said, Joe, would you mind walking me up the road? Because I was afraid. I actually felt fear. Where most people were afraid of me, I now felt fear. And fairness, in fairness to my neighbour, he walked me up. And when I woke up the next morning, I said the most sincere prayer of my life. 
I screamed up at the ceiling and I cursed. And I went, I can't do this anymore. Help me. And I somehow managed to get the courage to go back to my sister. I had to face, I had sent her child home on his own in two buses. And when she opened the door, she said, I hope you're here to pack your bags. Because I was living with her at the time. And my pride welled up in me and I said, yes, I am. She was the one and only person in this world who gave any, any care in the world for me. And I was willing to walk away from that. And as I was packing my bags, she came in. And again, I feel the hand of God on this. And she said, do you want a cup of tea before you go? Everything in Ireland is, is solvable with a cup of tea. What came out of my mouth was not of my own volition. I said, yes, please. What was in my head was to scream at her, go away and leave me alone. But yes, please came out of my mouth. And as I sat at the table drinking that tea, shaking, rattling, I said, Mary, I know now what you're talking about. I know once I start, I can't stop. And I broke and she broke and the look on her face. I seen that look of pain on her face for the first time. And she knew some people in the fellowship and she made a phone call for me. And a person came, we had a chat and they arranged for me to be picked up to go to a meeting that night. And that was on the 21st of March, 1995. And thank God, a day at a time, I haven't needed or wanted to pick up a drink since. I'm very grateful, very grateful. What it's like now? Well, I'm not 28 anymore. Life has happened and I've grown and I've developed and I've been through life's ups and downs and life's level times and I haven't picked up a drink. And I was very fortunate to meet a sponsor who was very honest with me. She was brave enough to be honest with me and she said, Sandra, you don't have time to take your time, love. You need to start changing now. And I really admired that. I really admired that honesty, that bravery, because people didn't speak to me like that. They were too afraid. So I, I was in awe that she approached me like this. So we started on the programme of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 steps. And I became curious. I became curious as to how, how does this work? How does, how, how can these 12 lines on a wall work? And very quickly it became very apparent where my powerlessness actually was understanding that actually understanding that once I started to drink I couldn't stop of my own choice I didn't know that I didn't know that up until that, that point when we worked on step two I understood how my previous prayers were never going to be answered because I was demanding all of the time demanding and petitioning all of the time I never once asked what God's will for me was never once because I thought I knew it all anyway. And moving into step three. Understanding that I had a higher power walking with me. Walking with me in life. Completely took away the loneliness and the isolation I was feeling. I began to feel a part of. I'd never felt a part of anything in my entire life. Never. And step four. Coupled with step five helped me to understand me in a way I had never understood myself before. It brought me clarity. It helped me to know what was driving me. The relief, that wonderful, beautiful, sweet relief that, that those two steps give me. For the first time, I had somebody listen to me, to my deepest, darkest self of me, the parts of me that were just so objectionable to me. And they sat there and they accepted me. Absolutely amazing. Amazing. In step six, I understood that it was the defects of character that harmed myself or others that I needed to work on and understood. And the shortcomings were the things I didn't do that caused harm or damage to myself and other people. And procrastination was a massive one there for me in excusing, very easily excusing things. Step eight and making that list was easy enough. I was willing enough for most of it. 
and there was a few that I was petrified about. However, walking with my sponsor, we were able to work out what the correct approach was. My approach at step nine was, if I have hurt you, and she was like, no, no, this starts with, I am sorry that. I learned how to take responsibility and own that, own what I had done. And, grew, and I grew up a little bit and I experienced those promises. The freedom that's in those promises is something I'd wanted all my life, but never, ever, ever, ever touched base with. Never, just not even close to it. And step 10 helps me to stay on track. And I don't have to wait until I go to bed to do a step 10. Step 10 helps me to continue to take that inventory and admit where I'm wrong in the moment and not let something build. And my favourite, favourite, favourite step, and I know you probably shouldn't have favourites, but I do, is step 11. Step 11 is just beautiful. Taking me into a space where I am with God, asking what is his knowledge for me? And asking for the power to carry that out. Totally takes away me having to rely on self-will. Self I don't have to worry what I do with my free will because once I align my free will with God's will, I'm doing okay. And step 12, I will always say yes to service anywhere I can. Anytime I can help, I will say yes to, to service. To carry that message that was so willingly given to me that has me here today. Thanks be to God a day at a time where all these days not picking up a drink. And I'm very grateful. I I. I don't know that I have enough gratitude to really, really express how grateful I am for this program, for the life that I have today, for the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, being there at any hand's turn. I'm so, so grateful. So grateful. I want to wish you all a wonderful, sober, happy St. Patrick's Day, or as we say in Ireland, happy St. Paddy's Day. And really, really, really just... Thank you from Dublin, Ireland. Thank you, Sandra, for your beautiful and heartfelt share. And happy St. Patrick's Day to you. I think that's probably the most uh, official sober St. Patrick's uh, well wish that we could have asked for, right? Uh, and Sandra, I certainly could relate to that about hangovers at school. I don't miss hangovers at all, but particularly hangovers at school. So thanks again, Sandra, for your share. Our second speaker this evening is John. Welcome, John. My name is John, and I'm a person in long-term recovery from heroin addiction a day at a time. Been clean for 24 years. My clean date is January the 13th, 1997. I was raised in Hartford, Connecticut. Had two wonderful parents. There's seven of us. I'm the second oldest. Uh, wonderful childhood, great parents. There was always a lot of uh, family members in the house, you know, aunts, uncles, grandparents. Uh, but my parents died early. My father died when he was 33 from an aneurysm, you know, and I, I remember uh, the trauma of it. You know, uh, became afraid of the dark, you know, start having issues in school uh, and was afraid to stay in the house. And I think, you know, for me, this is when a lot of my problems started. Uh, I kind of like start gra gravitating to to the street because now there's no authority figure in the house. Uh, I was about nine years old. Shortly thereafter, you know, my grandmother, who used to take care of us uh, that same year, uh, she died uh, on Christmas Eve. And it seemed like, you know, during that time, you know, it was one death after another. You know, my younger, my father, younger brother, who, uh, always came to visit. Uh, he died shortly after my father, you know, I think it was more 
grief than anything else. Uh, he drank himself to death. You know, uh, so by the time I was 15, I had a child with a woman, with a girl who was a little older than me. Uh, I got into some trouble because at this point I was, you know, smoking weed and drinking and, and uh, got arrested. And while I was waiting to be sentenced, that following year, uh, my son was born on Halloween and he died on Memorial Day. And shortly thereafter, you know, uh, my mother died on Thanksgiving Day. She was 43. So this kind of shaped how it shaped my thinking, you know, uh, and I really didn't have any, any hope in life. And so, you know, I gravitated more towards the street. You know, a lot of my friends were, you know, uh, drinking, using cocaine, using heroin. Uh, and I, I gravitated more towards heroin and I became a, a intravenous drug user for, for about 20 years, you know, going in and out of the system, uh, you know, in and out of rehabs, uh, just couldn't get a toehold in life, really had no hope, you know, uh, in life. You know, uh, at this time, you know, it was, you know, the AIDS epidemic and a lot of my friends, you know, began to die, you know, uh, from AIDS. Uh, my community that I was raised in, which was a beautiful community, is, you know, became ravaged with drugs and, you know, uh, a lot of poverty, a lot of the businesses left. Uh, and it was just drugs and crime. And, and eventually, you know, I made a decision that I would leave that area. And so with the help of some friends who had gotten clean and they made a decision that, you know, they would send me uh, out of Hartford to southeastern Connecticut. And I landed in rehab and, you know, and I began to see that on this journey that, you know, I had a lot of issues that needed to be resolved, you know, or solved, you know. Uh, but I thought at that time, all I needed to do was just stop using drugs and stop drinking and everything would, would work out. Well, that really wasn't the case, you know, on the journey for me, you know, uh, I ended up in a psych ward, you know, uh, due to depression. You know, uh, and during that time, I began to understand, and this is for me, that I knew that without God, I wouldn't make it. So I began to gravitate more towards the scriptures. And, you know, uh, after I got out of the psych ward and, you know, going to the meetings and, you know, getting a sponsor and working through my own process, uh, I landed in the church as well as the rooms at the same time. You know, I think that, you know, for everyone, uh, everyone has their own process. And so for me, you know, it was about, you know, therapy. You know, I had to accept that I needed therapy, you know, and I needed to go on medication, right? Uh, I needed the church, you know. Uh, for me, Jesus Christ was, you know, uh, very important you know, uh, to me, uh, and, you know, going to the rooms on, on a consistent basis. Uh, and so, you know, in time, you know, uh, I began to heal. Uh, I didn't need medication anymore. You know, uh, I continued to, you know, uh, vigilantly go to, you know, meetings and, you know, uh, stay involved you know, uh, in church, you know, and in time, uh, I, uh, in time, I actually, uh, became a deacon in the church and really not, you know, looking to, to be an official 
in the church, but that's what happened in my case. You know, uh, I actually uh, ended up working in the field, the same facility I went through to get clean. I actually ended up working for that facility. So uh, I've been working for that facility for the last 23 years. You know, up until that point, I couldn't keep a job. As long as I used, I couldn't keep a job. There was, you know, no way out for me. So, you know, I met a beautiful woman who I married and, you know, uh, and we built a wonderful life together. You know, uh, I have three children, two sons and a daughter. You know, I'm grateful that my children are healthy and doing well. Um, I reconnected with my siblings. You know, all of my siblings are doing well, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. You know, I have a, a wonderful sponsor, you know, uh, who looks nothing like me. Thank God, you know, uh, you know, but, but, but I love him, you know, for taking the time to guide me through the big book and the 12 and 12. Uh, I still, today, 24 years later, I still do three meetings a week. Uh, I still reach out to my sponsor. Uh, I mentor quite a few men nowadays. Uh, and I strive to keep a, a balance in my life and to stay, and to stay emotionally sober, you know. Uh, you know, during this time of COVID, you know, uh, it has been, you know, these are stressful times and difficult times for, you know, a lot of people, but uh, God has been good to me. You know, uh, I have not been unemployed since I've been sober. I have been well. My family has been well. Uh, I work with some wonderful people. I have some wonderful men in my life, as well as women. This has been a wonderful process. And so, for me, you know, it's, it's, it's important that I emphasize for me you know, uh, and I think that, you know, the big book talks about it as well. You know, uh, the big book of AA, when it talks about it has to be a psyche change, you know. Uh, and they talk about, you know, there's a piece in the big book where they talk about, you know, a, a, you know, uh, a spiritual experience where they talk about a spiritual experience, a spiritual awakening or, you know, a variety of education, you know. Uh, and they say keep coming because more will be revealed. So. You know, it's important to stay on the path, you know, in order to be treated, in order to understand, to begin to understand addiction in one's life and how it operates and how it works, you know, uh, affecting one's thinking. And it's different for everyone because everyone has their own process. So, you know, I am a man who is truly grateful and who have found a way out of the darkness. There is true freedom in recovery in the rooms. It's really a wonderful thing to, to watch others be transformed as well, you know, uh, who, who are on the same journey, who are on the same path, you know, to see people lives are being who are who lives are being rebuilt and transformed and to see people smile and to you know reunite with their families and to you know pursue you know their dreams you know it's just truly a wonderful thing uh, I'm grateful that I've gotten clean and that I continue on a daily basis to understand that without the recovery process and without God in my life, none of this is possible. I'm John, 
and I am truly grateful and thankful for this process and to have this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, John, for your share of your experience, strength, and hope. I can certainly relate, especially this week, to your, your comments about the people that you've lost to this disease along the way. Just uh, this week, I myself found out that someone who I used to, um, who I used to kind of run with uh, passed away from this disease, so I can certainly relate to that. Thanks, John. Our next speaker this evening is Nico. Welcome, Nico. Hey everybody, my name is Nico and I'm an alcoholic in recovery. Uh, so first I just really want to say thank you for this opportunity to get to share my story with you guys, um, get to be of service, and I want to say thank you to everybody that helped put this event together. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day. You know, I know uh, one of the most important things in recovery is having a sense of connection um, and that's been easily one of the most lacking things in the age of COVID. Um, you know, we have these virtual tools, thank goodness. Um, but that sense of uh, just feeling together with other people in this process is, you know, I know something for me that's felt definitely a little bit harder. So I um, just want to give a shout out to anybody that, you know, not only stayed sober over this last 12 months, but people that maybe began their recovery in these last 12 months or, or, or really recently and um, just give you tremendous props and respect and say, um, if you're able to make it through this, you're definitely going to be able to make it through some tough stuff. Um, you know, I've got about 15 minutes or so, so I can't cover too much of my story, but I really just want to kind of focus on how I've applied uh, the steps in my life and kind of what that's looked like over the years. <clears throat> um, I would say there really isn't too much to share about addiction. Like, we all kind of know what that's like, but Despite uh, being relatively young when I got sober, um, I was convinced, um, maybe I wouldn't have said it out loud, but inside I knew I wasn't going to live much longer. I honestly believe I was in the last couple of months of my life if I kept doing what I was doing. Um, I was spiritually completely bankrupt. I was emotionally um, just torn apart, depressed, sad, worried, anxious, uh, exhausted. And when I found myself in treatment, um, there was a part of me that was terrified, but there was another big part of me that was absolutely relieved. Um, cause you know, if you are just now getting sober, like, I just want to say like, you know, welcome home, like welcome to, uh, this new way of life and you don't ever have to feel like that ever again. So that was where I was at. It's just done right? Just done. Like, sure, I could have continued. Like, done doesn't mean I can't keep going. Done just meant, like, there was this crack in the door that allowed something new in. Um, and so, you know, I'm assuming we kind of know the basics, but the basics are important, right? I was told things like um, to start opening up about how I felt to people, like learn how to trust somebody, get a sponsor, and practice opening up to that person. And so that's what I did. And I started with just one person. I started talking about how I felt. I got other suggestions like go to meetings consistently, become known in them, uh, pick up a service commitment. Like, you know, I, I was asked to, to chair a meeting and in Nashville, um, there's a meeting house um, called 5925 and I guess that's the the number of the uh, the street, but anyways, that's what they call it. And so some of the meetings that I would go to there, you know, there'd be 120 people there. Um, and they asked me to chair that meeting. I was up there shaking, like wondering if I still remembered how to read. Uh, but I would chair those meetings, and I would, you know, I don't, you know, maybe I did a good job, maybe I didn't, but I would feel good about myself. I would feel a sense of healthy pride for doing something for someone other than myself. Um, I got other suggestions like work the steps with that sponsor. Um, and so the step work process to me is, you know, it's not about so much getting in touch with myself as it is about learning how to get out of myself, you know, because like 
through addiction, we just pile on and pile on all this stuff. Like we, you know, maybe we had difficult things happen to us or, you know, maybe we went through some things and then we started doing things that, you know, through our own actions that made us feel worse. And we just pile on this shame and this crap. And so in the step work process, um, I was able to start peeling back some of those layers and learning to look at things that um, I might have been looking at one way for years, like looking at them with a different angle um, and starting to see some of the patterns in the way that I was living and some of the ways that um, I was applying, you know, how I was in one situation in the past to what I was doing in the, in the present um, and inviting a higher power into things in my life. So anyways, that was a long way of saying that I started applying these basic tools in my life. And long story short, I started to feel better relatively quickly, you know, like I started to have that kind of glimmer of hope. And about a year and a half into my recovery, I was, um, I had moved out of the halfway house, I, you know, was renting a room with some, some roommates. Um, I have a son who was born when I was 17 years old. And at that time, I had lost custody of him. And so, you know, I was working on saving money, and I was going to get him uh, back in my life. And some people started coming up to me and talking about, you know, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? You know, you're 21 years old. Um, you have a ninth grade education because I had been kicked out of high school. You know, you're washing cars. So like, yeah, you're doing a great job in your recovery. But like, where is this heading? And quite honestly, like, I didn't know. And I didn't necessarily need to know, but it was time to start thinking about it. And so the person that asked me to share tonight is actually the same person that told me about this program for people in recovery so that they could go back to college or go to college. And I was convinced that there was absolutely no way that someone like me could do something like go to college. Um, You know, I think addiction starts chipping away at our ability to believe in ourselves, and it starts chipping away at our ability to be hopeful about the future. And so I had been telling myself for so long, like what I was capable of and what I wasn't capable of. And I would look at other people and I would think like, yeah, maybe they can have something like that. um, But I can't have something like that, you know. And so uh, this this gentleman that um, this friend of mine that asked me to share tonight told me about this program and me and a couple of other young guys and get invited with him and we get to go visit this program out in Texas uh, on a college campus for students in recovery and we get there and I have no idea what the heck I'm getting myself into. You know, I'm as far as I'm concerned, like I'm just along for a little vacation because there's no way that I'm going to do this because there's no way they'll ever let me in. Right. Of course, like self-defeating thoughts. And we walk, uh, you know, the the college campus has kind of that main street that runs into the middle and uh, kind of that open area quad type thing in the middle. So you take a left and uh, the street that you turn on to is is Akron Avenue. Um, Some of you guys might know that uh, that AA was founded in Akron, Ohio. So it's like, oh, that's kind of interesting name for a street go down a couple hundred yards on the street and on your left is a building that says uh, Center for the Study of Addiction and Recovery and it says Collegiate Recovery Community. So I'm just kind of standing there looking at this building and it has the word recovery on it. You know, like public and recovery don't go together in my mind. Like recovery is a secret. Recovery is kind of like shameful on some level to me still. And you walk in here and it's full of just young people um, going to school, backpacks on, you know, studying, you know, chopping it up with each other, drinking coffee, whatever. There's 150 students within this program. And I've never seen anything like that in my life. I had no idea anything like that existed. And I go and I meet with the director and I tell her my story and I tell her, you know, I'm, you know, I'm washing cars in Nashville. I've, you know, I've got this apartment situation. I'm working on getting my son back. And I tell her this story and I, and I basically say like, this is a great program that you have here, but there's no way I could do it. And at the end of that meeting, she just looks 
I can remember she has her hand on my shoulders, looks me in the eye and just says, if you want to go to school here, you can go to school here. And it was just one of those times when someone believed in me more than I was able to believe in myself. And so I went back, uh, got a GED, um, applied for the program and was able to get in. And I began my education journey. And long story short, um, I was not stupid like I thought I was. My brain was not fried like I thought it was. You know, when I went to my first college classes and they're like, you know, pull out an index card. I'm like, what the fuck is an index card? They're like, open a Word document. I'm like, what's a Word document? You know, what's double spaced? Like, I have no idea what any of these things are. Um, people have to explain to me how to do it. But but I, I'm able to, I, I do it. I ask for help and people help me and I figure it out, you know. And so anyways, um, during that process, uh, I get my son back and his mother... Um, never embraced recovery and hasn't since. So I became a single dad at about 22 years old. Um, I worked full time. I went to school. Uh, I graduated undergrad in three years and then went on to graduate school at, at a college in Nashville. And I, I just say that um, by no means to brag, you know, like it makes me uncomfortable to talk about the good things. Uh, but I want that to be hopeful to somebody because like I was positive, 100% positive that there was no way that I could go to college. And if and aside from that like actually do well at it. And aside from that do it while going to uh while working, while raising a son by myself. Um and yet, you know, God provided a way for that to happen. And so what I take from that experience is not necessarily anything that I learned in the classroom. It's just that I took from that an idea that anything is possible in recovery. Like, I might not know how it'll look or how the pieces will get to put together. I might not have all the information about what is available out there to help me. Um, but by applying this way of life one day at a time, um, God will provide a way. And so I've always taken that lesson of like, I might not think that it's possible, uh, but I most likely am wrong. Um, so <clears throat> what that did for me is really inspire me to want to give other people an opportunity to have an experience like I'd experienced, right? So um, I started working, uh, you know, kind of in the recovery field and different, different stuff. And uh, about four years ago, uh, a partner and I, teamed up to to found a program here in Austin, Texas for other young people in recovery um, to get to go back to school. And so what we've done is um, basically build that community like I was talking about so people can come and they can live here and they can get clinical services, they can get academic advising, you know, provide meals, do activities and events, you know, speaker meetings, tailgates, all kinds of stuff. Um, but it's specifically for young people in recovery to provide, you know, not only the support to stay sober, but the direction to go to school or go back to school or plan for the rest of your life. Because I think recovery is more than just staying sober. It's about applying this and seeing what you're capable of. Um, so that has been an incredibly rewarding experience for me. And I, and, and, you know, I think that my job, because I didn't understand like the self-centeredness concept of our disease um, for a long time, but what I've come to realize is that like by nature, I will want to focus on myself, you know, like by nature, I will be worried about me. I'll be worried about what's going to happen to me next, like what bad thing is coming around the corner for me. And the recovery process is all about getting out of that so that I can be of service to the next person that needs help. And so by, you know, what I'm doing now uh, on a daily basis is trying to get out of myself and pass on what I was given, you know, provide that hope to others. The other thing um, I'll maybe focus on for a second is just uh, applying recovery as a dad. Um, you know, 
I got my son back when I was 21 and he's now 13 years old, um, which is crazy. And we grew up together, you know, and I can remember like learning how to make my bed in the halfway house, learning how to do laundry, how to cook some food. And, you know, I didn't know why that was going to be important. But when I got my son back, I found out like, you're going to have to teach him how to make his bed. You're going to have to do his laundry for him. You're going to have to figure out how to keep this kid fed. Um, and so these, these experiences that I'm gaining, like I get to apply them later. Um, and I've taught him about spiritual principles like honesty and integrity um, and hard work. Um, you know, so he's in eighth grade and the other day he came to me and said that uh, he decided to switch lunch tables at school. And, you know, you can imagine, like, that's a pretty big deal. Um, I said, why, you know? And he said, like, I'm not really sure about these people I've been hanging out with. I don't know if they're a good influence. And I was like, okay, you know, I've been kind of kind of wondering, you know, that type of thing. And I said, well, how did you know that? Um, or, how, you know, what made you, what made you start thinking about that? And he said, well... Um, my friend Jack, and so Jack is a close friend of his that we know, and he said, well, I've been watching Jack, and when Jack hangs out with these kids, um, he starts acting different, and I don't really like the way he acts. And so when I look at Jack, I can see that he's changing, um, but he doesn't see it in himself. So if he doesn't see it happening in himself, that made me realize that maybe I'm changing and I can't see it happening in myself either. And I was like, you know, like, wow, that's some incredible insight. And it just, you know, I don't know, if, I don't take any credit for that by any means. But this is a kid who has grown up around principles like being able to look at yourself, being able to take feedback, being able to make hard decisions. Um, and so I can see like how my recovery is influencing him and his life. And a couple of years ago, I got married to a beautiful woman who has taken on my son as her own and we have another uh, baby together now so I have a 13 year old and a 13 month old sons um, which is quite an experience to be 31 with that already going on um, getting hit from all angles for sure but uh, you know just I think recovery is ultimately about learning how to apply this stuff on a daily basis and so you know, it might not be like flashy or that exciting, but like what recovery looks like is is being there um, to listen after a hard day uh, to my wife and what she has going on and just be there for her and, and being able to be affectionate as a person that didn't know what affection was and being able to listen instead of talking when I'm a person that always thinks that I have the right answer. Um, and, you know, get up in the middle of the night with a baby that doesn't know any better and just needs someone there to comfort and soothe them. And um, so, you know, simply by being present, um, I'm giving, you know, this gift to this baby that needs me, right? And so those are the types of things that move me. And, and as a person that couldn't cry for years and years, like now I, I can just just think about how much I love my children, uh, I love my wife, and just be moved by these blessings of recovery. And, you know, quite honestly, like, it's been, it's been a tough year. It really has. Like, it's been, it's been dark at times. It's been um, tough, uh, you know, financially and work-wise and all types of different things. And through all of that process, I have this constant uh, sense that I'm being cared for by something greater than myself. Um, through that process, I have, you know, literally hundreds of people that I can call on that would be there for me that, that will listen, that will, you know, provide some experience, strength and hope. And so there's never a time when I think this isn't the way that I want to live, even in the hard moments. Um, so I'm just grateful that I have been cared for um, by people like you that that show up 
you know, that because I know what it takes to apply yourself to this process. It can be hard. It can be absolutely amazing and awesome and beautiful and and really cool things. And then it can be tough, too. Um, So I just have tremendous gratitude for the work that you're doing, because the work that you're doing uh, will ripple out and help people um, like me that you might not even realize. So I appreciate this opportunity to get to share with you guys. Um, I hope that it's been uh, a really great day. I hope that you're, you know, whether you're alone or whether you're surrounded with other people that that you feel uh, connected, uh, because we truly are connected in this process. Um, And that's it. And thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Nico, for your share. Uh, I can certainly relate to uh, what you were saying about our self-centeredness. It's uh, it's kind of funny. I, I think that if anyone had ever asked me before about uh, being self-centered, I would have said, I'm not self-centered. It wasn't until coming into recovery that I really discovered the truth behind that. So thank you again, Nico, and thank you everyone for your shares, Sandra and John. It's much appreciated, and I'm sure that everyone has uh, has related to that experience. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for tonight. So thank you everyone for your participation. I will now read the uh, AA promises that comes out of the literature of Alcoholics Anonymous. The AA promises. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. So once again, thank you for joining us today. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone, wherever you're tuning in from, whether it's from Ireland itself or from right here in Connecticut or anywhere in between. We wish you a very happy St. Patrick's Day. And so we will now end our meeting with the we version of the serenity prayer. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference.